This is not psychotherapy. Dr. Wills does not have a provider-patient relationship with this guest. These are just two people talking about emotions. Welcome to Give a F*** Actually with your host, Dr. Alex Wills. Hey, welcome to another episode of Give a Fuck Actually. Today I'm here with Chase Tuning. Thanks for coming on. Dr. Alex, good to see you again, man. Thank you so much for having me here. Yeah, Chase is on Ever Forward Radio. Could you tell us a bit about that? And he was kind enough to have me on a few months ago. Ever Forward Radio is my show and it has been, um, which I'm sure part of what we'll get into here, really one of the most therapeutic outlets, creative outlets personally and professionally for me over the years, but at its core, it started as a true health, fitness, wellness platform about a little over six years ago. Now, when I myself was a clinical health coach, I've been a certified health coach since 2015. And that's what I went to school for and my master's and all my formal education and training uh, was to, to coach people, to train people, to get them well, to keep them well. And I really found that podcasting was my preferred form of CECs, basically continued education credits. And I began to just consume them on my horrendous commute back and forth in DC years ago, which is actually where I am right now, again, visiting home and family. And I found it just be the best way to tap into what is going on right here, right now in the world of wellness, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual well-being to help my patients. I would listen to a podcast that would show up to the clinic and I would have amazing new information or at least a new reference to give them. And it made me a better coach. And so I just decided to kind of lean into it and started my own show, kicked off Everford Radio January 22nd, 2017. And now it's what I continue to do full time for personal knowledge quests, but also connecting with amazing individuals like yourself that are just really helping the world, helping communities in big and small ways. How many episodes have you had so far? Today is episode, as we're going live, May 22nd here, or as we're talking, episode 709, 709. That's impressive. Uh, when did you start it? It's been uh, January 17th, so I, I, a little over six years ago now. So I guess going into my seventh year, mm -hmm. I think technically I've had more than 709 episodes go live, you know, getting my footing. I was kind of playing around the format of a bonus episode here and there, but, you know, traditional episode 709. And I honestly feel like I'm kind of just still getting warmed up, man. By the way, your studio is amazing. It's like the, the highest tech studio I've been in. Like you've really <laughs> gone up, but it was very impressive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, if we ever sit down again, we'll maybe have to check out the new one. Just open up a second one in LA, a little bit more on the West side over in Santa Monica. So got a little bit of a different vibe. So maybe we could crack open a different vibe conversation. I think you mentioned that it was, it's in the, the house or the building where they filmed the Jeffersons back in the day. I believe that's correct. Yeah. So it's an old production house where they do, it's kind of a creative space meets WeWork meets traditional, you know, office space. And they do, still do a lot of filming. Certain parts get rented out. And I believe that they start, they started shooting or shot some of the Jeffersons there. It's, it's been around for decades and decades. And you walk in, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's got that look and the feel of just a big old production house. It's very very inducing to the creative juices. Yeah, it was really special to be there down in LA. And so Chase has his MS in health promotion from American University in Washington, DC, certifications and a certified health coach, TRX stuff. And then in your bio, oh, yeah. the, the most interesting part was you had to learn to walk again and what you had Twice. bilateral hip surgery, reconstructive, like what, what was that all about? What was that all about? That, that, is a, that is a big question. I guess the long and the short of it is after graduating high school, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life and what I wanted to be when I grew up. Like I think all of us are at 16, 17 years old. And the concept of college and the concept of picking the thing that I was going to do and the thing that I was going to be, I was just struggling a little bit with it. I had some things that were of interest to me but nothing was just really calling me. And so I decided to kind of lead into a family tradition of military service. 
my father had been in the army. My uncle was a Marine. My grandfather was in the army World war II vet. Uh, basically every generation, we've kind of traced it back to the civil war, believe it or not, every generation, there's been a, a tuning, a family member that served. And I thought that was pretty damn cool. And <laughs> especially when they dangled a $20,000 enlistment sign up bonus and free college benefits and all that stuff. I was like, you know what? I'm going to go this route now. And then whatever I choose to do after it'll be there. And I'll have a lot of great support in terms of benefits and education and all that. And so I enlisted in the U S army back in 2003, I was still 17 years old and about four, four and a half years into my original six year contract, I was in pursuit of a deployment and I was doing some pre-deployment war game training and I suffered career ending injuries in that training environment. I wound up really, um, kind of just my entire midsection for lack of a better technical term went to shit. Um, I tore my left hamstring, uh, had some like severe, like, like my L4, L5 vertebrae kind of like decided to go one way and the rest of my back went another way. It was just a really quick sudden, I was leading an ambush with my, my squad and just, just one of those things, those freak things to where you're going too hard in the wrong direction, the wrong body movement, just all the conditions I was just doing incorrectly, just extremely fatigued. I've been out there for days, probably running off of literally four hours of sleep over three or four days at that time. And uh, just, you know, not really fully aware of my biomechanics, uh, you know, <laughs> and postural movements. And so I was leading this assault, suffered those injuries and it wound up actually snowballing into much more severe issues with my femurs. So much so that I wound up getting pulled, not only from that deployment opportunity, just my unit entirely transitioned to a medical hold unit. And they're like, yeah, actually we need to kind of go in. We need to, we need to fix the situation in your hips. And so I had both of my femurs completely reconstructed. And at the time, this is 2007, 2008, um, the procedure was pretty gnarly. Now I understand it's much cleaner, way less downtime. So they went in surgically dislocated, uh, and reconstructed my femur head, put it back in, put two rods in the hip. And then I went through about a six to eight month recovery time up from where I could walk load bear fully again on my own with both feet. And then they put me back under, cut me open again to do the other side. And so for about the last 15 ish months of my military career, I was just a patient. I, I was in the hospital. I was in physical therapy, rehab, pool therapy. I was bedridden mm -hmm. at home. Um, you name it, I've done it, um, on a cane, on a walker in a wheelchair, relying on people to just, you know, daily living. And then they ultimately deemed me completely non-deployable, which in the military, if you're not deployable, they really have no need for you. And especially back then, you know, during the height of Operation Iraqi Freedom and Enduring Freedom, that was top priority. So they medically discharged me, but being in that physical condition and even mental condition at the time, kind of having to reevaluate my entire life at the age of 24, again, my whole life plan had changed against my choice. I decided to, again, lean into it. And I, I, I took that as, as an opportunity to really understand the human body. So I then about two weeks after getting discharged, came back home to Virginia, enrolled in school in Richmond, Virginia, and started studying exercise science really as, as a, as a need, I felt I needed to better understand the human body. I needed to better understand what my body was now going to be like, because I didn't want to accept this hand that I had been dealt of just, Hey, good luck working out again. Good luck, you know, walking pain free. You're never going to mm -hmm. run again. I literally toured the campus for this program with my mom helping me. I was still on a cane at the time and I'm 23, 24. And I just remember really clearly going, this is, this is not going to be my life. So I'm going to study this vessel that I have here and try to just eat as much out of it as I can. And then I just really fell in love with it as a career and, you know, kind of then went into, you know, health coaching and wellness and all the things. Such an amazing story. That must have been so devastating. What emotions came up for you during your darkest hours? I mean, such a huge blow. You're 24, younger, it's so unexpected. And you were, you know, you were doing your best. You were doing everything that you thought you should be doing right. And then what, what, what were those painful emotions like and how bad did it get at its worst for you? 
That's a really interesting question and one that I've been prompted or asked before and thought about a lot over the years now. So I was 24, right? When I got out, I'm 37 now. I've had quite a good amount of time to really do the work and reflect back on all this stuff. When I get asked that question, what, what was it like? Where was my head at? How did I get through that? I really don't think I was fully aware of what had happened to me and what was happening to me because of kind of the mental state that I was still in from the military. Mm -hmm. I, I don't for lack of a better term, I'll say brainwash, but you know, anybody that served, you know, especially in the military, I can only speak my experience in the army, especially from such a young age, from 17 to 24, I had my entire belief system, my, my daily living, my outlook on life, the way that I did everything from making my bed to receiving orders to accomplishing tasks was just very militant, of course, was very regimented. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of just took that as chase or sergeant tuning at the time staff sergeant tuning you know this is your next mission these are your orders and so i kind of just was like okay uh this this is where this mission ends i now need a new mission i need the next task i i like i said i only had about two i think maybe three weeks of downtime after being completely physically wrecked for almost a year and a half uh, that's the only downtime i took before i embarked upon the next mission the next thing enrolled in school full time. And that was my, my life for the next four years. So I think I didn't really have a grasp of what was going on at the time. Maybe that was, you know, I was blind to the trauma. Maybe I, I didn't have the EQ, the, you know, awareness to really <laughs> understand what was going on. But now looking back, I've been working through it a lot over the last couple of years. You know, the more and more really? I've been getting in tune with my emotional intelligence and prioritizing and increasing my mental health work, I'm uncovering a lot of emotions and familiar sensations that remind me of back then that I only now have the tools to first of all, understand, hold on, that's not air quote here, normal, that that's not healthy. So now let me kind of retroactively go back and work on that mindset that everything really. And so it, in a way it was kind of a blessing in disguise because I was so quickly able to move on I guess you could call it resiliency, but um, definitely not the most healthy transition uh, I've ever had, but I'm working on mm -hmm. it now. You know, that, that reminds me when I was doing my training in a land far away a while ago, there was one evening I was asleep in the hospital and I was in that kind of uh, brainwashed military mind zone as a medical resident. Mm -hmm. And you're just kind mm -hmm. of, you're just there to serve. You're just there to follow orders and to do whatever you have to do. Three in the morning, my pager went off and I went down. The next thing you know, I'm barely waking up. I'm pumping the chest of this 14 year old boy who had shot himself because his girlfriend broke up with him. And we ended up doing, you know, five more rounds and there was no chance. Uh, dad was in the room, completely devastating. And we, we had to, we had to call it. I remember it was, man, probably six years later. When I finally broke down and I had some huge emotions about that come up, you know, I, I was crying. I, I felt the full impact of what had happened. But I remember that night kind of being like a robot. Like after that happened, no I had to go yeah. on to the next patient. I had to go back up and I had to get ready. And it was just the next day business as usual. So I I'm curious, w was there a moment later on down the road when you thought back to uh, what had happened to you and how much you were kind of robbed in a way at such a young age that you did have some emotions come back? One that actually recently came up actually during a, a ketamine therapy session. I felt like during my journey at the time, I felt like I was kind of coming out of it, so to speak. I was coming out of the experience. The medicine was wearing off, but I was actually revisiting a memory. And instead of me in that moment, waking up and coming out of the experience, I was back in my second, uh, surgery after coming, coming to, from being under anesthesia. And I was back in my hospital bed and I was waking up for the first time, just kind of feeling very grog, oddly enough, you know, probably definitely on ketamine again, back then, you know, for an eight hour <laughs> surgery, uh, I was knocked out hard. 
So it was very, very similar in mind and body. And I remember this now on this journey, I had this overwhelming sense of, of fear. I, I was, I was afraid because I was alone. Mm. I was in a hospital room all by myself. My girlfriend at the time was not there. She was there for my first one, my first surgery. Also, my stepmom came out for me and uh, this one was all me. There was no medical personnel. And so I just remember waking up and not being able to feel my body from the waist down, mm -hmm. remembering how difficult this was the first time. So I was immediately hit with this wall of, of fear and, and anxiety and did this one go well? Am I going to have any problems? You know, where is, where is everybody? Where's the doctor? Where's the nurse? Why, why isn't my friends or family here? I was just so alone and I was very afraid. Mm -hmm. And that told me that I had all that happen back then. Those emotions happened back then, but for mm -hmm. whatever reason, I just dismissed them or yeah. I just kind of wrote them off or, oh, it's the medicine or, oh, it's this, it's that it's whatever. You know, or just also still being active duty technically at the time, I just acknowledged that very, very quickly and dismissed it because that was not conducive to the situation. You know, we're taught to just stay mission driven. Any other concept of fear, of worry, anxiety, it had been drilled into me that hesitation means death. If you let really? anything other than the mission come first, if you let all these other worries and woes creep in. That's when you can slip, that's when you can fall, when you can die, when you can make a mistake, you know, cause a life or a tragedy for somebody else. And so I was reliving this moment of being very afraid of being very alone and, and also mm -hmm. now like very like sad for that younger version of myself. I, I wanted to just kind of be with him. I wanted to let him know. I'm here mm -hmm. with you now. It's okay. These motions are very real. And of course you would be feeling them after such a traumatic physical experience. And so that's a very real and recent example. Yeah. And you know, you're no less brave or courageous for being able to go back and identify those, those emotions that were always there. Mm -hmm. You know, the step one of radical emotional acceptance is to drop the fuck shield, but we don't want to discount the fuck shield because it's really interesting. Organizations like the military or medical school residency, they really promote this, you know, we use the term maybe a little bit jokingly, but kind of all, there's a little bit of truth to it of brainwashing and yeah, 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 being exactly. mission driven. Mm -hmm. And it, it's important in life or death situations. You're a doctor, you're responsible for saving someone's life. You're in the military, you have to complete your mission. It is life or death. It's important to be able to use those defense mechanisms to use denial, to suppress those emotions, you know, temporarily in order to, you know, be stoic and complete something. So we don't want to say that there's no value in that and recognize that in sometimes, you know, some places right. there are, I think that it can be misused quite a bit too, you know, to try to control uh, certain groups. However, if you could have gone back somehow, I know for me, I, I carried that burden unknowingly in a way for about six years before I finally had that emotional release. For me, I would have loved to have been able to go back and maybe that weekend or very soon after kind of have right. some kind of a emotional process yeah. because it, it was sort of like slowed down. You know, I wasn't in the heat of the moment. I wasn't on duty. W what about for you? One of the things I've thought about the most and I guess collectively what we're talking about here, having a better understanding of the state of my emotions, the state of my feelings, what am I feeling? Where am I feeling it? What is this here to teach me? What is this here to signal in terms of, is this a physiological response? Is this a mental response, emotional response? I didn't really do any of that back then. I would love to go back and just give that chase waking up alone and afraid in the hospital recovery room or any other version of chase that suffered the injury that went through the first surgery that lost his father at age 19 to a trauma illness that was distraught about being thousands of miles away from his family, you know, during such a, a really trying time, I would love for him to just have permission to feel. None, none of these things I truly processed. I, I, I was quick to dismiss. I was quick to 
try to convince myself and other people that it's not that bad. It's not that difficult. I can handle it. I can take this on and I can take yours on and I can take the world's on because mm -hmm. I'm the oldest brother. Like I said, I lost my <laughs> father. So I kind of felt this need to rise up and be the new man of the family. I was a, a, a young soldier. I was coming up in the ranks. I was stepping into leadership responsibilities. I was having all of these things happen around me and seemingly to me that I never stopped to really give myself permission to process those feelings and to really ask mm -hmm. Chase, what do you want out of this situation? How do you feel about this situation? Also, who do you have in your life and in your corner that Maybe you're not there yet to, to really reach out and go, I need help, but to just let some of these things out so that you can have a better understanding of them and to let the right person or persons know how to then maybe properly help you. Is mm -hmm. it just physically being there? Do you need words of affirmation? Do you need physical touch? You know, I know I'm kind of talking about love languages here, but I feel like that can also go hand in hand. And, you know, processing and understanding emotions, especially when it comes to getting support, getting the right kind of support. So I would really love to go back and just give Chase that Chase permission mm -hmm. to feel and just ask for help really, truly. That's like beautifully said. I love that. I, I wrote down permission to feel that's, that's mm -hmm. so good. And then, you know, mentioning the love languages, I was a volunteer at this retreat center and the guest speaker was Gary Chapman, who wrote the five love languages. No way. Oh, perfect. Amazing. And yeah. One of my jobs was to give folks a ride in a pontoon boat. So I gave his wife and him a ride and we, we happened to be next door to Bill Gates compound on the Hood River Canal. Oh, and wow. we went around, did, did the little tour. And the funniest thing was they sat there in awkward silence. It was only them on the boat with me the entire time. And I could like, you could cut the tension with a knife. So I think, Interesting. I think their love language was the silent treatment or something like that, but that's a little that's bit of a behind one. the scenes. The sixth one didn't make it into the book, apparently. Yeah. I, I thought that was really, I don't know how much to read into that or not. I'm curious, anything that you wanted to talk about today, any emotions that came up for you, any recent situations, or as we've been talking about this, like kind of just checking in where you're at, what's sort of on your heart at the moment? Yeah, great question and a timely one, because this is actually something that I've been going through recently. You know, I mentioned earlier now kind of having a few years of the work under my belt and really prioritizing mental health and uh, emotional health and revisiting the more difficult times in my life, the more trying times, the more traumatic, particularly in my injuries and my time in the military and the death of my father. My father was, you know, my best friend. He was a huge influence as to you know, my decision to join the military. And so his death was one that was very, very difficult for me. And one kind of like the scenario of my surgery that was more difficult than I realized. And one that I did not open up about really at all for many, many, many years. And it was really just a matter of time until that came out in a very unhealthy way. Uh, I, I went years with undiagnosed PTSD, years of not sharing how I truly was feeling first and foremost with myself, but secondly, with hardly anyone in my life, not even best friends, not even family members, not even the family members closest to me and my father that also suffered that loss. And because of a lot of this work, and I do give a lot of credit about almost two years ago now, after getting this formal diagnosis of PTSD and going back to psychotherapy and then going in for ketamine assisted psychotherapy, I had this just incredible series of breakthroughs and PTSD and, and revisiting the traumatic death of my father and the years of me not processing that and not grieving for 15, 16 years later, I now have had such a better relationship to that period of my life. I'm still learning, but I have a much healthier relationship to me with me in that period of my life and the death of my father. And 
it's come out in a lot of unique ways. I've been sharing it more with friends and family. I've even created podcast episodes and YouTube videos and created social media content and been putting a lot out there. Very, very open, real, no hold barred kind of explanations and pieces of content. And I had this conversation with my mother actually recently, we went out to lunch and she had watched one of these videos where I actually was sitting down with my brother. This was for his podcast. And he was kind of learning a lot about me in that experience that he had no idea about and really, you know, where I was mentally and how unwell I was. In fact, the whole reason for me being in pursuit of deployment was of my own volition. This was a volunteer thing that I was seeking out because I just had completely given up really, I don't want to say the will to live, but I, I just completely didn't care if I lived or died anymore. I was never going to take my own life. I never felt or can even relate to the thought, you know, of, of suicide, but I absolutely can relate to the thought of waking up another day is so, so hard. It is so painful. I feel like I don't know what I'm doing with my life. I was questioning my choice to even join the military because it wasn't, it wasn't like my mandated by my father, like you will do this, but you know, I, I'm like, in a way I did this for him and I did this for a way to continue on this legacy. And this big part of this legacy is gone. And I was in pursuit of being deployed in kind of hopes that I would die overseas. And my mother watched this video where I was sharing with my brother where my mind and my heart were at this time. And it was totally new information for him and totally new information for her. And this is years and years later. And they're both now this lunch experience. My mom just, you know, started getting emotional and was just so taken aback that a mother was so unaware of oh the mental state of her son and right. where he was and the decisions that he was in pursuit of making that could have ended in not only her burying her ex-husband, but you know, a son as well. And where I'm going with this is in my pursuit of developing a healthier relationship with my life and the traumatic experiences and in my pursuit of prioritizing mental health and emotional health, I am able to share things in a really unique way. And in, in many cases for the first time ever, I'm sharing things. And so it's become easier for me to talk about them and to discuss them, but it's hitting very hard for a lot of other people in my life. Right. And it's a lot to take in. So imagine a best friend, a family member, you go years and years and years, and you just now find out about how they were going through the most difficult thing in their life to where they were even questioning wanting to be alive and you had no idea. And so what I'm finding now is kind of the next step in my continue continuation of working through this PTSD and continuation of just strengthening my mental health is really getting better at being a support system for the people in my life that wish they could have been a support system for me. It's kind of this weird new position of, yes, I'm the one that went through it and I'm the one that is now discussing it, but it's like almost totally new information for them, which then kind of makes that unique experience pretty new in and of itself. So I'm finding now that it's not, it's not just me getting better at being me and all the things it's actually needing to be a stronger version for the people that I really care about for them to better understand what I went through so that they can process it. And so that they can hopefully now have more information on what to pick up on, you know, in the future, because to them. I was fine. I was all well and good. It was great. I'm just this optimistic, outgoing guy. So now they have all this new information to really look at me and have a better understanding of me. And so I, I want for them to have that. I, I don't want to relive that ever again. I, I want the right people in my life to know when to, to reach out to me and to probe me and to let them 
for them to let me know that, Hey, they're there for me. So maybe, you know, I'm not picking up on the cues and I'm not asking for help. At least they're better equipped to really have this information on their radar. That's such a great example and explanation of how we can ask for help, how we can make other people aware of our emotional needs. And instead of it being a weakness or something to be ashamed of, it's actually courageous. It's brave. It takes uh, some guts to, to be vulnerable and to make people aware. I'm curious, as you think yeah. about this sort of new mission that, that you find yourself on now, <laughs> what, what, what emotions come up for you? Thinking about your father's passing, thinking about how no one knew, just without explaining why, could you list out the different emotions that you're noticing in real time? I'm experiencing, if I'm understanding correctly, really a lot of freedom. Yeah. I'm feeling a lot of weight being lifted. I'm feeling a lot of, this is nowhere near as, well, I don't want to say it's not as difficult as I thought, but the difficulty is shorter lived than I imagined. The difficulty mm -hmm. in facing this traumatic event again, this difficulty in turning and facing my woes, my problems, my lowest lows of life it is way shorter lived than I imagined. And I'm not saying shorter lived as in, oh, like a couple minutes here and there, but going 13 ish years of not facing all of this and mm -hmm. now being at a point about two years into working really through it to sit here to talk with you and not have a panic attack to not, you know, be so shut down emotionally to not get sad emotionally is really nothing in comparison. So a couple of years of regularly checking in on myself and working with and for myself and working with mental health professionals is nothing in the grand scheme of the rest of my life. Because the trajectory I was on the rest of my life of just it compounding and getting worse and worse and worse is so liberating. I think and we have so a lot of emotophobia where oh, this yeah. belief that if I go into the sadness, if I allow myself to feel the depths of this emotional pain, if I allow myself to experience all of the fear, it's only going to get worse. I'm going to get stuck in that forever. It's going to destroy me. And it, I'm going to be devastated. And so it's almost like we have no choice but to continue mm -hmm. to run from it. But when we actually yeah. go into these emotions, like you say, you discover, wow, that wasn't so bad. It, it wasn't nearly it, these, these painful negative emotions weren't there to just make me worse. Exactly. That's so well said. The more and more that I can just sit with and, and make time for these air quote here, negative emotions, I'm reeling really learning so much about how much of a unique teacher they are and how much of a bad rap these bad perceived bad emotions get because they're it's discomfort it's pain it's 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 not sexy it's not easy they have been the greatest teachers of my life mm -hmm. and in a way it's even been a little bit more difficult for me because i've realized part of what I was hanging on to by not addressing these difficult times and difficult emotions was actually because of bring it full circle to ever forward radio. I realized that if I got better with my relationship to my deceased father, if I got better to that, with that relationship to that pain, what does that mean for what I'm doing now? And what I mean by that is ever forward was this mantra that my father had while he was alive. It's something I had heard, my family had heard our entire lives. It's just who he was. It was his belief system. It's what he said. It's how he lived his life forever, literally up until his dying breath. You know, these adversities truly can be amazing advantages in our life. Should we choose to face them, sit with them, learn from them, you know, kind of to quote Ryan Holiday here, similarly, the obstacle is the way, or, you know, he's quoting really Stoics there. But in a way, I, I thought if I really got better and I don't have this, this 
dark, tumultuous, you know, relationship to my father's phrase that I have now branded and carried the torch with, what does that mean for me? How, how am I going to keep doing this thing? Because I created the show really as a way to continue again, legacy and his mantra. So what does that mean if I don't have that same relationship to it? Am I going to know what it means? Am I going to be able to, <laughs> to keep going? But the answer is absolutely yes. I have just developed a whole new relationship to that, that is not better than, but just different in a unique way that has allowed me to excel in the professional side as well. I really like that idea of emotions as teachers. You know, they're, they're there for a reason. We have them. They're not just there Absolutely. to torture us. They are giving us wisdom. They're helping us to understand things. And I, I really do believe emotions are the sixth sense because they give us data and information that we do not get from our five senses. Mm -hmm. And we don't get from our thoughts or perceptions. They're telling us some magical information about how we are relating to ourselves. We're relating to our loved ones. We're relating to society. And if we can tap into that, and not be afraid mm. if it's scary or painful or icky, then we could, you know, see them as our teachers. That's such mm -hmm. a great way to think of it. You know, it took me some time to get there, but I'm here now and wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah. What now? I, I like that the freedom, you know, you're, you're sensing this freedom, I guess the emotion of relief that mm. you were sort of on this quest for many, many years of your life to soldier on, to power through yeah, literally. <laughs> quite literally. And yet now that you sort of face these demons and realize that they're actually your teachers, it's like, wow, freedom, relief. Freedom, not only in the sense of, I don't have to keep running from this anymore, but kind of to piggyback off of what I was just talking about and really the identity. I had associated to those feelings and those dark trying times and how I had taken it and created something out of it and was, you know, building platforms with it. Freedom in the sense of I, for the first time ever, and at this point at age 35, when I kind of had this awakening of, I now finally get to truly and freely be chase to have mm -hmm. such clarity and and healthy association to all ranges of my emotions and all types of feelings in the past present or whatever i might conjure up about the future i had this new overwhelming sense of freedom of oh my god i get to be my fucking self for the first time in <laughs> 35 years which was so liberating <laughs> but also, again, kind of daunting. It's like, be careful what you ask for. Who am I? Mm -hmm. What do I believe? What am I going to say yes to? What do I say no to? If I'm no longer running from anything. And if I'm no longer creating out of what I, I, I thought existed in the past or what I had to keep alive from the past, what does that mean for my present? What am I doing, you know, with my life? And it really, you know, I think a lot of other things kind of contributed to that. A lot of other external factors. This was really right in the, the height of COVID and lockdowns. And I live in Los Angeles. And during that time, it was very, very hard to just really do anything. You know, it was just, everything was closed and it was open. It was closed and there's so many crazy restrictions. And I was just, you know, from a public health perspective, even just confused uh, as to what was going on, you know, maybe I'm alone here, but that coupled with all this work that I was going through, it made me look at my world. And the world I felt for the first time with fresh eyes mm -hmm. and it was so overwhelming. It was so daunting, but like I said, so liberating and freeing at the same time, because I realized, first of all, it's okay. It's okay to have these questions. And it's almost like I'm having my first state of true consciousness ever as a human being, because then it then also was followed by, I get to create it. Mm -hmm. I get to write my own narrative now. I get to, as long as I keep up these habits, these, this way of being physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, 
that means I have total freedom over what I do with my life, who I keep in my life, what I hold to be true or false, what I think is up or down, left or right. It was just this massive internal and external freeing this, this just almost like rebirth in a way <laughs> that I had never experienced before. And it's been palpable by so many other people. It's one of those things where you ever just, you catch up with somebody after a while and you're like, you know, you're different, man. What's you know, you seem like you're on a new diet, are you working out, like you get a new haircut. And I even notice these things in me. And so it's been great to kind of get this feedback from other people that, you know, Hey, whatever you're doing, you seem happy. And to get really that happiness feedback, I think for me, has just been the greatest little pulse check that, you know, I'm doing things in a way that I believe are right and I'm happy with and that I love. But to get that feedback, you know, the people that you come in contact with also receive that and also respect it and also are happy for you and want to be happy with you it really does help kind of keep, you know, me on my new true north. I find it really helpful to help myself appreciate life more by imagining that our lives are like this epic movie. And mm -hmm. in a sense, we're kind of doomed to live the life and the character that we were born into. At the same time, if we have awareness that we also realize we are the actor playing this character and we can interact, you know, not to say it's just a fake movie or a video game, but it's very much reality. And we get to sort of co-create how the story goes with certain limitations. And we mm -hmm. can experience these relationships with other people depending on what we do. And to me, that really... I, I don't know if it could possibly be true or something like that, but psychologically, it really helps me to kind of stay in the moment and to kind of realize that there's a lot that we can't change, but there's a lot that we, we do have uh, influence over. How about you? Absolutely. Kind of brings to mind this quote from Seneca, one of uh, the Stoics that I, I love diving into. He has this quote that says, we suffer far more in imagination than reality. It, we suffer mm -hmm. far more in our imagination than in reality. And I think that's so just universally applicable. You know, right. Whether that's, you know, what my story, what I've been talking about, or even just the daily stressors, if we can just remind ourselves that we're in our heads, not in the best way possible, and then look at what is actually happening. I mean, that's freedom. Yeah, that's a good point. Of my medical clinics here in Idaho, uh, Perma Mental Health, we were like one of the first and probably largest uh, distributors or I guess prescribers of ketamine. We don't prescribe oh, it for people to take home, but we do, you know, give it in our offices and we monitor people for safety and all that jazz. I was curious, since you had mentioned it, what, what were you, if you feel comfortable talking about it, what do you feel like you maybe got out of ketamine or insights that you may not have gotten without it. Well, I mean, not to like play it lightly, but I, I truly do believe like it gave me my life back. It gave me my mm -hmm. life. It gave me my life. But to give some specific examples. So I went in to ketamine assisted psychotherapy in pursuit of working through my PTSD. And my intention and goal was to say I wanted to get over my father's death kind of sounds harsh, but I wanted to finally get to a place in my life where I can, to my heart of hearts, know and accept that was a thing that happened every time that I think about it, every time that I talk about it, every time that, you know, someone else brings it up or just in speaking of movies, a father dies or someone gets diagnosed terminal. I was tired of having to relive that pain every mm -hmm. single time. And I wanted to, I didn't even know if it was possible. I wanted to get to a place where I had such a better level of understanding that that is possible, that I can leave the past in the past and I can revisit it when I want, how I want. And the present doesn't always have to be flooded every time by the more painful parts of the past. Mm -hmm. And truly that's what I had happen in damn near every session that I had 
But the most specific example, and I think the one that gave me the most of what I was seeking was in um, one of my sessions, it was something that happened so quickly and briefly during my journey. I didn't really pay it any attention, but this is credit to what I think is one of the most important parts of this type of work is the integration afterwards. Mm -hmm. I actually, after my journey, I was with my wife, who is a ketamine assistant. Or she's a psychedelic nurse practitioner. So I kind of was just sharing with her my journey and just recanting it. And I just kind of was like, oh yeah. And there, you know, and then I, my, my dad, I saw my dad and, you know, I kind of just like, like, Hey, like, just like waving by kind of thing. Like you're in a car and you just like see somebody like, Hey, mm -hmm. but the way that I told it to her and the way that I just like caught myself, I didn't have that flood of emotions come back. It was as if my father was still alive. And I literally just saw him. I was like, oh, hey, dad, all right, cool. Yeah, I'll see you later. To, to have that level of, of nonchalance in talking about one of the most important people in my life who is no longer with us physically, I didn't think would be possible. I, I never would have thought, I never would have believed you if you told me that, Chase, you're going to get to a point to where you can just mention your father in such a flippant way as if he's just down the road or you can pick up the phone and call him. It just gave me this sense of knowing that he's not, he's, he's physically gone, but mm -hmm. just that, that connection that I had with him was just a reminder that he is somewhere else that I can always revisit, whether in, in my heart, in my mind, and, you know, a plant medicine journey or ketamine or whatever. It was just the sense of knowing that. I can go visit him there on my terms. Mm -hmm. I don't have to be re revisited by him all the time with all these painful emotions. And that I just started bawling. I just <laughs> completely broke. And I was just like, it was more like happy tears because I just, again, mm -hmm. felt this weight lifted of, I didn't think this was possible. I never, mm -hmm. ever thought that I would ever be able to get to a place like that. And it just happened. And yeah. It's been amazing ever since. That's so amazing. It, it does bring tears to the eyes, like the, that healing, because I've experienced that a lot of folks, and statistically, we know this in the studies with psychedelics, a big percentage of folks are not able to get that healing without the psychedelics. And, and it sounds like you might be amongst one of them, you know, amongst them. It was pretty intense. I'm not gonna lie. And I, I really do credit, you know, going in, you know, having, you know, the therapy work beforehand. And I, I have been really working on my own for years and trying to address this kind of stuff. So I think having a, a lot of the work done on my own, coupled with professional therapy, coupled with really, really specific intention, I think set me up for the most amount of success possible. You know, even long story short, in my first couple journeys, I had the most immediate and wild ego death I have ever you know, really experienced, you know, in a lot of psychedelic journeys, but just to have that happen so fast, I have, you know, I've heard that, you know, it, many people don't get there uh, or it takes many, many sessions to kind of get that experience. Mm -hmm. um, but my first journey immediately after that ego death of just literally like, oh, I died, I separated from my body, became just this, this being, you know, my soul, I guess, whatever you want to call it. And the complete rest of the journey, I was just with my father. And it wasn't as if I'm going back in time and I'm visiting him when he's sick. It was, we picked right up. It was as if it was that day, that moment, we were just hanging out. We were doing our thing. It was just father and son. And again, to have that sensation of we can be here together now in the present without all of that pain, without all of that loss was just wild. Again, things that you never think would be possible, but. It happened. It happened in some really intense ways and ways that are so ineffable, but are the most real sensations I've ever experienced. We have to kind of result or resort to phenomenology with psychedelics because we don't understand exactly why and how they work. We, we know that they do work, mm -hmm. but there's this phenomenon that I've been noticing, which is you said a moment ago that it was just kind of like, you know, a switch, like mm -hmm. with the emotional mind. There's no stories, there's no logic, there's no math to kind of work through. It's sort of like it either is or it isn't. It's either okay or it's not okay. 
And psychedelics seem to have that magical ability to go through and kind of defragment the right brain emotional hard drive and to say, okay, you know, the, these emotional wounds, these bad things that happened, they happened and, and that's, that's okay. It happened. And, and these are the painful emotions that came with it. And that's okay too. And then just sort of reset everything to kind of start over. It's, Mm. I mean, we can kind we have to like resort to these analogies, which are not really perfect. You know, there's that one where it's kind of like you have this, a snow hill with like all of these grooves in it, people sledding down again and again. And then people end up going on the same trails because they get worn in. And then over time, those get so set in stone that we can't get our minds out of those grooves. And then with ketamine or with another psychedelic, it's like a new giant snowfall comes and it's like resets the snow hill and you can have new trails and you don't have to go into those old grooves again. And you can kind of create a new story, a new emotional reality about it. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that makes total sense. And speaking from experience. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, any other thoughts or anything else coming up for you today? I'm in a very, very good place in my life, or I should say I'm, I'm in a, a unique new place in my life to be on the other side of all this work and all these conversations and all these realizations and all this freedom. You know, it's, it's really interesting to to be in such a different place and to be in a place that you didn't think would be possible really does change damn near everything in your life. When you have such a a newfound appreciation for your life, for your feelings, for your identity, it is, it's wild. It's a wild ride. It it can be, you know, I've used this word daunting quite a bit, but I think that's Mm -hmm. the best word to describe it, but it's like daunting in a good way. Yeah. I'm in this place now where I'm in the driver's seat of my life and the driver's seat of my emotions for the first time ever. And it's pretty damn cool mm-hmm. when, you, when you have that level of awareness and belief in that, not that the future is now so much better or you're invincible or you have all the answers and all the tools, but just this knowing that I am in the best position possible to push forward, to go ever forward, because everything up to this point no longer has pain, no longer has disappointment, no longer has anything other than contribution to my best self and my truest self. And to feel empowered with all of that is the now driving force behind my life. And it does kind of make me feel the most resilient I've ever felt before and the most hopeful and the most just sunken in my truth and my belief that no matter what now comes my way, I am beyond capable uh, of handling it. Nice. I love the title of your show, Ever Forward, because... Thank you. Whether we like it or not, we're going ever forward anyway. And to get in sync. Time waits for no man, right? Exactly. Helps us to get in sync with uh, the reality of that and to realize, you know, right now, I like to imagine right now being eternity because right now is really all we have this (laughs) moment. And to enjoy the nowness of it, as, you know, Eckhart Tolle talks about everything going on physically, mentally, but also emotionally enjoying the nowness of, I don't know why, but I'm having a wave of this emotion and that emotion. And to look at it all with uh, curiosity as living this uh, magical, amazing movie that we're all living together. That's the truth, man. Well said, well said. So where can folks follow you and all that stuff? So if anyone listening, watching is interested in what living a life ever forward is all about, if you would like to tap into pretty much every damn way I could think of expanding awareness around, at least awareness around physical, mental, emotional, spiritual well-being and learning life lessons from myself and connecting with thought leaders such as yourself, industry leading experts in the world of entrepreneurship, wellness consciousness, psychedelics, medicine, just anything and everything that 
can make you stop and go, hmm, apply it into your life, at least get something new that you can test and, you know, to propel you forward in your own life and whatever you are in pursuit of. That's what I mean by saying living a life ever forward. So come check us out. I put out two episodes a week, anywhere and everywhere you listen or watch podcasts, Everford Radio, Apple, Spotify, everfordradio.com. And then my social media, particularly the Instagram at Chase underscore tuning is where I'm living my day-to-day -day life. And I'm just no holds barred sharing what I'm doing, what I'm using, products, services, states of being, mindset, workout, wellness. You know, I am still a certified health coach. I I go back every two years and renew all my certifications. And so I, I like to really practice what I preach and share everything, the good, bad, and the ugly, but also stay within my scope of practice, of course. And so if you want to just see a snapshot in the day-to-day -day life of someone that is in pursuit of living a life ever forward, and trying to just optimize everything internally and externally as much as possible. That's what you can see over there. And I would love to connect with anybody who's curious. Thanks for being on Chase. It's been awesome. Alex, my pleasure, man. Good to see you again. See ya. Hey guys, thanks for watching. This is Dr. Alex Wills with Give a F Actually. Make sure to check us out on Apple Podcasts or anywhere you get your podcasts. Thanks for watching. Make sure to check out the merch store. RadicalEmotionalAcceptance.com Bye! Bye!